We are live. This is a screaming red alert buy signal, completely irrational move in the bond market. Growth is slowing down right now and bonds are crashing. This is exact opposite of what should be going on. A lot of weird moves in the market we'll cover today, but let's first off take a, a second to realize our high risk strategy delivered a 233% total return in 2021 turning every $10,000 into 33,000, and it's already up 7% in 2022. What's gonna happen next, our interest rates are going to stall out, fall, and this portfolio is going to rip higher. That's my expectation. Now, if you're on a free trial, we're recommending you put $10,000 to work in our high-risk strategy. This would mean buying 85 shares of the crash insurance UVXY, 213 shares of our favorite growth asset. This is like getting into Microsoft when it was three years old. So that's ETHE, Grayscale Trust, 213 shares. Okay, and that's the product that's gonna do well if growth slows in the economy and interest rates stay flat or fall. Uh, and that's what I see coming in the short term. Now, if interest rates rise and inflation remains just insane beyond everyone's expectations, which it has thus far, we're hedging against that risk with the ticker BOIL natural gas. We took profit on NRGU and boy, that thing keeps screaming higher. We believe we can get a better bang for our buck through the end of February. Uh, going long natural gas. We've got some tensions in Europe with Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan uh, that could cause this to go skyrocketing up. Uh, and just in general, there's too much money and too little energy. So this is a beautiful portfolio. The growth position uh, is really the technology play that we see investors making the most money with over this decade. We've concentrated the bet into that single asset. Now realize the richest people in the world are not doing an extremely diversified strategy. Most of the top 10 richest people have a very concentrated bet. And for us, we really like Ethereum if you're going for maximum growth. In terms of hedging our growth position, we need to realize that long duration growth assets hate it when interest rates rise. So we hedge that risk with energy products. When interest rates rise, these almost always keep up uh, with the interest rates going up. And right now that hedge is boil. Notice we have a two to one ratio. Okay, so I think we're more likely to have interest rates fall in the short term than rise. Otherwise I'd have you heavier in boil. Now what's gonna protect you from energy prices falling off a cliff? Well, that's really where your UVXY comes into play. So you combine the strategy and each position protects the other. That's why you wanna build the entire portfolio out at one time. Okay, so the bond market's back to a critical crash level. It's been bouncing on this. If you wanna follow a ticker, it is TLT. There's a massive, massive short position on the TLT. We've got the big uh, liar bankers like Jamie Dimon coming out saying he thinks the Fed's going to hike rates six times this year. Total bullshit. He's only saying this so their bank can load up on these. That's what I expect. Uh, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is the economy is slowing. GDP has been revised down 50%. The last stimulus checks were in February. The U.S. economy needs more money injected into it. Uh, so I find it extremely unlikely that the Fed's going to do all these rate hikes, that the inflation won't slow down, uh, and that we're going to have this robust economic recovery without more uh, fiscal impulse. So bond markets at a negative return of 1.6% on the TLT today. And almost comically, uh, we have the banks crashing and we have the growth stocks, tech stocks going up which is completely abnormal. So the, uh, the smart money knows where to go right now. And so it's been this volatility in the bond market that's giving you a beautiful entry point into both the NASDAQ, Bitcoin and Ethereum right now. Okay, the bond market has crashed back to this critical level 
and is highly unlikely to go any further to the downside, which means as yields fall, you wanna have your positioning in the growth sector. And we'll be covering this in more detail. Uh, now, again, if the Fed does not protect the bond market, the entire global stock market will collapse. Furthermore, if the Fed really starts to hike interest rates six times in the next 16 months, uh, all you're going to see is money flood into the dollar, into U.S. Treasuries, and you're going to see most likely uh, the highly overvalued stock market have a significant crash. So that's what we're looking at. Meanwhile, in our safer strategy, which we call safe growth, we're betting big on emerging markets, Asia, which has a large Chinese uh, position, about a third of it. China is getting ready to ramp up spending as the US is slowing down and tightening monetary policy. And so we're starting to see some big names that are down over 35% uh, from recent highs like Alibaba jump higher right now, uh, signaling the bottom very well likely is in and you wanna have that exposure. I believe inflation will peak out by March and slow down all this Fed hawkishness. Uh, in other words, I believe they're going to revise all these dot plots and forward guidance uh, to, uh, to understand and give communication that the economy is slowing down right now. So let's take a look at our two strategies. The safe growth strategy is where we recommend investors put 70% of their money. Okay, this is not gonna be putting a, a massive bet on a cryptocurrency. In fact, it's going to a global stock portfolio. It's very similar to the way Ray Dalio manages the largest hedge fund in the world. Uh, so very, very in line with that. And in general, the strategy is pull profits off the high risk program and put it into the safer growth strategy. So every time your high risk doubles, pull back, reallocate to the safe strategy. On the other hand, if your high risk has some volatility to the downside, we're going to pull money out of the safe growth and put it over to the high risk. In January, the safe growth is up 3.6% and returned 25% in 2021. The high risk strategy uh, is doing very well, 7.5% return in January with that 233% return in 2021. All right, what's the key macros to focus on in 2021? Congress increased the debt ceiling by two and a half trillion dollars. Okay, we're going to get more worried about the growth to value rotation, the bond market crashing later on in the year. We need to see jobs coming back online and we need to see the Build Back Better bill passed to believe that these interest rates can break through these critical levels. Without that, it's highly, highly unlikely. Okay. In general, bonds go up if growth slows down, and that's exactly what we're anticipating. So we want to have exposure to the technology stocks aggressively right now. Now, if we look at the deficit spending, I want you to note the only time that we've had a surplus uh, where the government spent less than it made was in 2001, and you ended up with a two-year stock crash known as the dot-com bubble. Okay, the government's never attempted to do this again. And uh, so that's what's really important for predicting the stock market and where to allocate capital. So McConnell has given the Democrats a silver platter saying, go for it, spend another two and a half trillion dollar deficit. And that's exactly what the US economy needs to avoid a recession. Uh, so again, all they need to do now is agree on how to spend the money. With Biden's approval rating at 33%, uh, I believe not only will they pass the Build Back Better bill, uh, that there will be stimulus checks attached to it. And most likely timing is going to be in March at this point. Also, remember, there are trillions in corporate stock buybacks. This means corporations are taking the massive profits they make and they're using that profit to reduce outstanding shares. So revenues can stay flat and earnings per share will go up as long as they're allowed to sit there and buy their own shares back. 
Okay, now not only did we have a low December labor growth of only 200,000 jobs, not only did we have unemployment claims jump to 350,000, we just had retail sales come in at negative 2.3% today. Okay, so growth is slowing. And again, that means you wanna be long the only companies that deliver growth, that's the tech stocks. And that's where we're heavily allocated. Uh, furthermore, the Atlanta Fed has revised GDP down by 50% week over week. So uh, at this point, cash is trash. Governments globally are devaluing. Uh, the only thing that'll make the dollar a really profitable bet would be six rate hikes, which again, we do not think will occur. Bonds are still garbage, okay? The, the highest interest rate you can get is negative 5% a year against inflation. Okay, so those bonds still have a lot of crashing to do. We just don't think it's going to happen until again, labor comes back online and stimulus is provided to the economy through the Build Back Better bill. So cash is trash, bonds are garbage. Investors have no other choice of where to put their money. You need to be long stocks, crypto and commodities. And again, we need to have the right ratios. Right now we're essentially 60% growth, 30% value, and then 10% hedging against a complete calamity stock crash. This is likely to melt up. These assets are very likely to go straight up until bonds become attractive. Now, our biggest fear is again, strong labor market and rising rates, but that's the exact opposite of what's happening. We have lots of people getting laid off. We have very few new jobs being created and there's no stimulus. The economy is slowing down rapidly. So that's not a problem. Okay, but stagflation could be a problem. We do need to recognize that uh, it's becoming a political issue for the Democrats that the inflation is far greater than the wage growth. And so consumer confidence is falling. So this is a very difficult time period uh, for the Democrats and for the central bank, because uh, if they tighten, they could likely kill the inflation, uh, but cause massive layoffs in a stock market crash recession heading into midterm elections. So most likely they're gonna talk a lot of talk and do very little uh, trying to walk this fine balancing act. That's why it's so important that you watch our Monday, Wednesday, Friday webinar to be ready for the trade alert. We'll be ready to pivot on a moment's notice if we really think that they're going to, by design, try to crash the stock market to kill inflation. And so we got to keep a close eye on all these metrics that predict inflation, uh, which again is our expertise. Now, again, if anything goes haywire, UVXY, the VIX, position protects us against the stock crash and it can deliver way over a thousand percent return. In 2020, in March, it went up 1100% in four weeks. So you could have sat there and done nothing and actually seen a total return that was highly positive just by having that 10% hedge sitting there ready for that black swan event. So in general, right now, I believe is a beautiful time to get position in the high risk growth and safe growth portfolios. Now, long-term, we are expecting a great rotation out of tech into value and value would be your banks and your energy companies, which would be accompanied by interest rates rising due to lots of inflation that's sticky in the economy. We're only predicting in the very short term until those two key catalysts come through that interest rates will fall back down as the economy slows and send your NASDAQ and cryptos back to new highs in short order. Now, here is a good lesson in 2021, right after they passed the two trillion Biden stimulus plan and the Trump one trillion stimulus plan, uh, plan back to back December and February. Uh, at first, you had energy and tech all go up at once. So that's green for energy and candlestick black for growth or tech. 
but the market did not like all this increased debt and suspected that this could create inflation. And so the bond market began to crash rapidly. That's what you see in the yellow line. Now note what happened, energy went up, tech went down. So again, the energy position is there to protect your technology position. And the UVXY position is there to protect your energy position. The three go hand in hand. So very good. I guarantee you, you don't have all the hedging devices in your portfolio that we have today. So I really recommend you call Dean at 505-322-7515 to get a complete walk through our service and a customized screenshot that you can put to work today. And don't forget, there's only three available spots per day at the special pricing. Okay, very good. So we'll cover the exact investment ratios. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, I do wanna hop into uh, key data, uh, look at some interesting bond market action uh, that's a little different than we've done previously. Okay, so very good. Uh, reverse repo is at 1.6 trillion. We have no reason to believe that we need to get out of growth stocks when reverse repo is over a trillion. It's still at 1.6 trillion. This shows there's high demand for US debt products uh, and this acts as a quantitative easing buffer. Next, if we're long energy products, we gotta be worried about irrational politics causing lockdowns. And so we've been watching the hospitalization data. It did jump week over week. So keeping an eye on it, looks like there's no appetite in the US uh, for lockdowns. Now we are seeing some pretty crazy stuff out of Canada, Australia, uh, and Germany, various European uh, countries, and of course, China, uh, but not in the US. All right, here is our new energy play, and you can see how correlated these are. Uh, we entered this position, and it uh, was outperforming on the 12th, pulled back on the 13th. Again, this was due to a uh, strategic release of oil, uh, but oil is ripping back higher, and I anticipate boil to leapfrog higher all the way to the end of February, which is where we will rotate out of that position. Uh, this chart, we're looking at a couple ETFs. We have the NASDAQ, QQQ, NRGU, it's our oil play, uh, the triple T, and then we have the banks with FAS. And so interesting today is that we do have interest rates rising, uh, but we had the banks sell off aggressively. Uh, but meanwhile, our preferred inflation hedge is doing its job, which is NRGU. Uh, although we're currently in boil. All right, in this chart, we're looking at emerging markets. This is the sector of the stock market that I believe will have the greatest performance of the decade. In the safe growth strategy, we have a large position. To get the exact asset allocation, again, you'll need to upgrade so you can see the very end of this video. What we've been looking at is the interest rates relative to emerging markets. As you can see, if interest rates are going up, tends to be very bullish for emerging markets. Uh, but more interesting is we're looking at FXI and MCHI. And you can see that's where the pain has been coming from in emerging markets. So we really want, uh, which is two Chinese specific ETFs. We really wanna see this bottom out and catch up. And that's exactly what we're starting to see are the Chinese indexes catching up to the bigger ETF. Okay, the Russell 2000 is Stanley Druckenmiller's favorite indicator uh, for predicting the markets. In general, it likes rates going up. So when I see that the IWM has traded flat all year as interest rates foul, I find that to be a bullish signal. It just needs the spending catalyst or the fiscal stimulus to come in uh, to really get the next leg higher. Uh, so at this point, uh, still trading flat. Same thing with the European index, almost the exact same chart as IWM. Uh, it took a little bit longer to hit its peak and has had the exact same pattern. To be trading flat with rates falling uh, is again a bullish signal 
We just need more stimulus to come through the US. All right, here is DXY. Uh, this was very overbought on the RSI, peaked out at 97. Uh, and we believe this is going to slowly fall towards 90, which will be a signal to take big profits uh, on most of the portfolio and get more defensive. Um, so that's where I'm looking for it to bottom out. Now, big picture, it could go much lower. I just believe in the short term, that is going to be our trigger uh, to take profits on primarily the crypto, uh, the tech, and the uh, and the energy play. So we'll be pulling off a lot of the inflationary bets and probably buying the dollar and treasuries at that point. So we should see another massive sell-off in treasuries as DXY approaches that level. Okay, another thing we're watching is the Turkish lira. This was potentially causing a lot of buying pressure for the dollar. Uh, it had devalued its currency from eight to the dollar to 14. So your purchasing power lost uh, half of its power. Then they came in and guaranteed Forex losses and it seems to have stabilized. So this does not seem to be a big issue currently. The Chinese currency remains very strong. Uh, their main goal is to become a reserve currency and to open up their bond market. And so they've been trying to pop bubbles in their economy uh, to be able to stop all these restrictions on currency flows and prepare to become a dominant player uh, this decade in the bond and currency markets. Uh, so. No signs of problems in China outside of problems they've created themselves, again, to try to clean up their economy. All right, lumber futures have been very predictive of inflation. Uh, they've been moving before energy products. And so uh, I actually ignored the signal over the summer when lumber futures fell. And sure enough, it did predict a fall in oil. So I could have actually delivered two profits on NRGU to our clients, uh, but missed one of the better opportunities. Today, lumber futures continue to climb, signaling energy will keep going higher unless something stops it. So what's gonna stop the demand for energy? You tell me, I, all I see is a slow but steady increase in demand for energy uh, through this year. And so there's a handful of countries that are still doing lockdowns like China, as they get through or tired of that, uh, we're just gonna see a steady energy demand growth. And there's very little investment in this space uh, to, to change the supply side. This chart, we're looking at some of the big tech stocks that have been keeping the NASDAQ alive. Uh, most of the NASDAQ's down over 50%. Uh, all the money has gone to the companies that actually generate real growth and real revenues. So we're keeping a very close eye on, uh, perhaps you could just close it down to Tesla, Apple, and Microsoft. If they're not falling off a cliff, uh, we should not freak out about our growth positions. And so while they're having a little bit of a pullback, still at very elevated prices. Now, we are starting to see some money flow out of tech giants in the S&P 500 uh, into the greatest performer uh, recently has been Berkshire Hathaway, just kicking some butt in the candlestick. Uh, you can see since, uh, since December, it's up 16%, only being outperformed uh, by I believe, uh, yes, Bank of America. So we're seeing the money rotate into uh, these value companies. Uh, and that's the slow motion prediction we have over this five-year time horizon. Okay, over in Asia, we're focusing on Taiwan Semiconductors, Tencent, and Alibaba, and all looking very bullish, finally getting this really nice performance in Alibaba, Tencent, and Taiwan Semiconductors, three large positions in EEM which we're playing a special three times leveraged emerging market ticker, uh, which I'll cover at the end for paid members only. 
All right, over in Europe with our European index, Toyota Motors continues to go higher. Uh, and I think that's probably just the best barometer of that ETF. There's a lot of companies, but no massive position. Uh, so this is probably the, the best single company to look at for a canary in the coal mine uh, event. So if Toyota were to fall off a cliff, uh, that would signal problems incoming, not happening. All right, Exxon is breaking through that Fibonacci level, being very stubborn, loving the rise of oil costs. Uh, so it looks like our uh, rising interest rate inflation hedge is intact uh, for, the force, uh, for the near term. This chart, we're comparing oil to interest rates. And we can see for much of the year when the Fed was aggressively buying treasuries, interest rates were stubbornly uh, going the opposite direction of the oil market. Now that they're going to stop buying treasuries uh, by March, you know what's going to happen? And so we're already seeing these start to track very, very closely. Eventually, high prices will kill demand. And we're starting to see that in the retail sales. Uh, so uh, potentially it goes a little bit higher. We are right at the recent high. Uh, perhaps it breaks a little bit higher and then tops out. I don't think we're gonna get oil going to 90 in the next three months. So keeping a close eye on that. Uh, we did have copper futures jump out of its trading range to a new level, uh, which could continue if China starts to get uh, more aggressive. Now, the cost of a shipping freight from China is at an all-time high. Meanwhile, the cost of the Baltic dry index, shipping commodities between various continents, uh, continues to fall. So this is one of our uh, only deflationary signals that we see coming through uh, outside of the labor and US GDP data. All right, uh, if we want to be <clears throat> worried about the Fed hiking interest rates, all eyes are on the two-year bond. And the Fed's way behind this bond. If we zoom out a bit, uh, we can see it's gone parabolic up 363%. And for a while, while the two-year was going up, the 30-year was actually falling. So that would signal a recession incoming. Uh, if we zoom into a shorter time period, uh, they're starting to go up together. And we'll be looking at the yield curve spread. Uh, right now, we're really positioned for the two year to stop going up so much and for the 10 and 30 year to, to start traveling higher. Uh, but again, I don't anticipate any big moves until the Build Back Better bills pass, which I don't think will happen until March. And it's only going to happen if the PPI and CPI stop going up so, uh, so rapidly. Okay, this is the 2 and 10 yield curve. So two year is worried about federal funds rate and short term inflation. And the 10 year is more of a, uh, a way to hedge your portfolio against a stock crash. And so in general, what we're seeing is the uh, yield curve is flattening. This signals that the Fed's going to hike rates and it's going to crush the economy and create a stock crash. So that uh, is currently the trend and no signs of this changing. Now in this chart, we've got a whole bunch of yield curves. Um, I do like the bond market, but I am not an extreme expert. Uh, people will use these various spreads to predict when the recession will occur and how long it will occur based on all these time frames. Um, and this is really neat because it goes back 90 years. Whenever these go into red, we enter uh, an inverted yield curve. So you can see it did invert before the dot-com crash and the 2008 crash. Uh, today, that has just not happened on the 10 and one year yield. Uh, the 10 and two year yield you can see also has that same thing, but a lot more inverted uh, through the 70s. So the great inflation era had a lot of inverted yield curves. 
Now here's the five and 30 uh, inverted in 2000, not all the way in 2008, uh, but in general, all of the yield curves are uh, flattening except for some of these really short term ones. So this is problematic, um, but we'll see if this starts to change shape as the Fed stops manipulating uh, the market so much and, and, and starts to slowly hike rates uh, into this year. Here's that TLT. Again, it's at this Fibonacci level. Uh, this is the recent low was 141. Uh, if we go below 141 on the TLT, I will get concerned that this is going to cause carnage to tech stocks and crypto. Uh, at this point, I believe that this is being overdone and will bounce back up and most likely trade in a range uh, between 142 and 150 until more stimulus is passed. And that's because the economy is clearly slowing. And when the economy slows, interest rates fall. They don't go up. All right, in this chart, we're comparing Ethereum to Tesla. They haven't been exactly the same, uh, but they've been similar in their pattern. Uh, in, in general, we're seeing Tesla leading Ethereum. Right now, Tesla is telling us Ethereum should go higher, which I know a lot of us are heavily invested in crypto. So it's absolutely critical that I'm correct that we're going to stop crashing and that we are going to get that big bounce higher. All right, in this chart, we're looking at gold and silver. Boy, those have just been going nowhere for a year. Uh, there's a huge discrepancy in the return and the gold to silver ratio. Uh, so keeping a close eye on it. I don't think right now is the best time to go long silver. Uh, we may need to wait for a policy mistake, a big crash, and then even more aggressive QE to bet big on silver. It looks like it may not have that nice jump this cycle. So at this point, we are out of that position. Now, if the, if the CPI and PPI keep going up and don't slow down, uh, then the Fed likely will have to crash the economy to stop the inflation ahead of midterms. And so our plays would be EUO, probably half the account, uh, treasuries, most likely 20% of the account, UVXY, potentially 10. And then we'd probably... Uh, play emerging markets for the rest of the account. That would probably be my crash portfolio if I really thought the Fed was going to, uh, by design, crash the economy ahead of midterms. Uh, meanwhile, with the bond market falling, the crypto space is going up. So they're saying that's BS. And we had tech stocks going up today. So looks manipulated to me. Uh, gold to copper ratio just gives you a feel for how long energy products uh, and metals that are useful to the economy can outperform uh, the store of value play. And so I expect in general, we're going to have a repeat of 2002 to 2006, where interest rates are below inflation, suppressed, uh, and there's a slow but steady recovery. This is predicting interest rates, and uh, there's currently a 36% chance of three rate hikes by July. So the bond market on the front end I was getting very upset about the inflation and expecting the Fed to do something about it. Meanwhile, the long end uh, is starting to, to believe that the Fed can pull this off. Uh, but in general, when we look at the economic data, it really doesn't support interest rates rising on the long end. Now, here's another way to look at the yield curve. And I'm going to show you what they want it to look like. Uh, compared to what it does look like. So funny, uh, yield curve was really nicely shaped ahead of the election uh, before Trump did his stimulus and before Biden did more stimulus. Uh, what's happened is too much stimulus, too much inflation, not enough growth, not enough jobs, and you've got a really messed up yield curve. 
So the black line is how they want it. The blue line is exactly what they don't want. Uh, so we're going to see uh, as much chicanery as possible to try to fix that yield curve uh, without crashing the economy. Unfortunately, they don't have a good track record of dealing with these problems. Okay, the VIX futures is still pricing in the most risk uh, between January and March. That's where you see the greatest jump uh, in the price. And again, we, we have uncertainties in the inflation data and federal policy, federal reserve policy, uh, as well as getting this stimulus passed. So that's where market participants are hedging the most. And we have amped up our protection as well. All right, here's the cryptos we're interested in. Uh, Polygon, uh, this is from the eighth. Let's go from this bottom. Uh, so on the rebound that we've had since the 10th, now uh, we've got Binance Coin up 14%, Polkadot up 14, Cardano 13. Uh, really interesting, the founder of Ethereum did a poll on Twitter asking what currency you would want if it wasn't Ethereum in the future. I think there was the dollar, Cardano, Binance, uh, and Cardano is actually one of his partners left Ethereum to start Cardano. And overwhelmingly, everyone picked Cardano. We'll, we'll get the exact details on that. Uh, Bitcoin up 3%, AVAX 6, Ethereum 7, Solana 8, Polygon 12. Okay, uh, UK looks like they've hit peak cases coming down. Where this all came from South Africa, it's over for them. Uh, and the U.S., I believe, is getting near a peak, and this is going to start falling. So I don't expect lockdowns to negatively affect energy prices. Rate of change of cases falling down. So it looks like we've really hit the peak. And, uh, and so we're going to slowly see people get back to work uh, as this new variant fear uh, dissipates. Here's where we're watching treasury auctions. We don't really care how much Janet wants to raise as long as reverse repos. Uh, at 1.5 trillion. So I'm not worried about interest rates due to uh, raising money. Now, this is interesting. They, this is the producer prices. They revised last month's higher and this month's came in hot at 9.7. Uh, but is this showing a topping on producer prices? It needs to, if this hits 10 and goes up to 10 point anything in the next few months, uh, then most likely CPI is not topping out by March. And that's critical. We really need uh, the inflation data to top out by March and begin to fall into summer. And that's going to be the perfect setup for how we're positioned uh, in the short term. Okay, job openings still highly elevated. Lots of potential job recovery. Uh, the New jobs was only 200,000. Expectations were something like four to 500,000. So that came in very weak. Uh, wages are still rising, but way be below inflation. So our salaries, uh, this hit 5.5. The spread here is uh, 0.6. So what I want to see is the next three prints, the spread uh, to shrink. So it can go up but it needs to slow down. The rate of change really needs to slow down. If we're gonna believe the Fed's going to back talk these three to four rate hikes or Jamie Dimon's ridiculous six rate hikes. Uh, and, and so that's gonna be very, very important. Uh, at this point, we just need to be patient. That was a big leap. Uh, the previous spread was only 0.3. So the spread doubled uh, month over month, very bad news if we want to see rate hikes not uh, be super aggressive in 2022, which we don't if we're long growth assets. Okay, jobless claims jumped to 230,000. Uh, labor force, so this is a big problem. There's about 4 million jobs that never came back online. And this group of people is primarily over 50. They own stocks, they own a house. They're going to live on the increased appreciation of their assets, take loans against it, and not go back to work. Okay, so that's a drag on the economy, of course. Another reason why hiking rates right now 
could be a disaster. We are seeing banks help out while the government's slowing down spending. So we're seeing credit ramping up and the rate of change is going faster and faster. That's how we are currently positioned. Uh, consumer credit continues to grow. Here's the retail sales falling. Uh, so one print like this is not a big deal, but if you get a few in a row, uh, again, that will be problematic for corporations' profit levels, and it's going to signal that the economy is slowing. So this actually could be a relatively bullish data point for stocks if it keeps turning out negative, assuming it causes the Fed to slow down its hawkish policy. Uh, consumer spending, uh, we don't have a new print for that, but it's at a all-time high. Balance of trade, highly negative, um, which again is a reason to be bearish on the dollar. China's PMI is jumping back up. Their credit impulse is growing. Uh, and they just hit a record import and export. I'm not sure this is the most recent print. I think this one is, though. Exports jumps to $3.4 trillion. Uh, in total, exports, imports out of China, $6 trillion. So that is the strongest economy in the world for sure. Uh, okay, European PMIs staying above 50 positive territory. US central bank balance sheet jumps to a new high. This is the best way to predict stocks right now when they're adding to it. Although we got to realize they're likely coming to an end of this by March and then may let the bonds start to slowly roll off and shrink the balance sheet. Uh, we'll see about that. Europe's central bank jumps month over month and Japan's remains flat. Heading over to the news, uh, Chai Girl points out, oop, this is updated. Consumer sentiment, and they're mostly looking at the Michigan uh, data, uh, has broken the 2020 March lows. Consumer inflation expectations hit a new high. Let's hike the interest rate seven times. Uh, so he's saying that'll crash everything but perhaps the consumer sentiment is low because of the inflation. So would hiking rates improve sentiment? Maybe, but not if it causes a stock crash. Looking for bright spots, I still like emerging markets for 2022, driven by falling earnings growth differential and a bottoming credit impulse in China. And down here, we can see the bottoming credit impulse starting to lead up. And again, it would be very important for China to print if the US is going to tighten and not create a disaster. Okay, Savon Henrik uh, has been pointing out that we've seen bottoms in tech stocks, uh, or the S&P, excuse me, on the 19th of each month. Uh, and we are a week away from that. So we're gonna see another week of volatility and then a big jump higher. I, I don't put too much, uh, faith in that type of logic, but interesting pattern uh, to at least look at. Luke Groman says the biggest energy exporter in the world has 13% of its Forex reserve in the Yuan, the Chinese Yuan. Says it's a signpost that again, money is slowly becoming less dollar uh, centered. And this has jumped uh, about 8% from the last print from a year over year. Alf, I think he's part of Real Vision, I believe, uh, says since the great financial, and he's one of these bond bulls, since the great financial crisis, we've never seen proper concerted central bank tightening across the world. In general, it's, it's uh, one loosens while the other tightens and they take turn going back and forth. That's the scheme. You know why? Because when a few central banks front load the Fed, fine. But once the Fed seriously starts and others try to follow, it generally ends bad. And we're seeing where the Fed tightened. Uh, the dot-com crash that lasted two years, they tightened through the whole damn thing. Uh, and then, uh, excuse me, leading into it. And then that caused uh, the opposite weakening. And then they tried to tighten from 2003 to 2007 until it created a crash. And then you can see they go the exact opposite. Uh, and again, right here, tight. Uh, Tightened for a few years once Trump came into office, caused a stock crash. First, it was crypto crash, 2018, January, then emerging markets, then European markets, and then it 
the final quarter when the 10 year hit 3% yield, you got the US stock crash. And then they went into the famous PAL pivot and started to loosen policy. Tracy Chai Girl says you're gonna need a lot of asphalt cement and steel for that oil uh, and materials looking at the uh, infrastructure, which is planning to upgrade 15,000 highways. Atlanta Fed GDP now drops to 5%, was 9.8% in November. So the Fed has the data that the economy is slowing. Jamie Dimon says it's clear that wage, housing, and oil inflation is not transitory. Yeah, how are they going to get that oil down? That's a big political problem. All sorts of news feeds coming about Russia invading Ukraine. So we'll see if that plays out. Uh, but I would suspect that if they did start having tensions, uh, that they'd start restricting natural gas into Europe. Good for us if that occurs. Live mon um, this guy's name is Albert. Live Monitor says, Diamond is a liar. Every time he opens his mouth, he's lying, bashing the 30-year bond so he can buy them. University Michigan consumer sentiment. Uh, typically, as we raise rates, the sentiment falls. And then as we reduce rates to lower, the sentiment goes up. Uh, and then you can see in this cycle, they rose rates, got away with it for a while until it started to crash, everything and sentiment went lower. So it's already falling. It's already fallen dramatically from 100 level to, six, uh, to 70. So what would happen if they hike rates and create a recession? This would most likely fall. Uh, and this has been predictive of markets. So unless they wanna crash everything, I think it's unlikely we get all these rate hikes without a lot more recovery in place. Savon Henrik says, you already know where it's all eventually heading. Janet Yellen says the Fed purchases of stocks and corporate bonds could help in a downturn. So right now that's against their charter. They're not allowed to do that. In fact, much of which they did during the 2020 March crash was against their charter. They created all these special investment uh, vehicles to do it. Oil demand is expected to grow at four to 5% over the next fiscal year. Uh, and really, if we look at the big picture, do you think demand for energy is going up or down this year? Obviously up. This is an interesting photo uh, looking at the 30 year treasury yield and what happened from the 50s through the 80s. Those interest rates went up, 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 up due to inflation and the Fed having to hike interest rates higher and higher and higher. It was one of the worst returns in bonds and stocks simultaneously for 15 years from 65 to 80. You made nothing on your stocks and you had a lot of volatility. Um, and so most of us investing have lived in an environment where rates have fallen uh, for the last 40 years and stocks keep going up even with these uh, temporary stock crashes that last a year or two. Are we coming into a paradigm where we have a repeat of the 65 to 80 realm? I don't think that's the case right now, but certainly an interesting chart to, to observe here. And the impact of pushing rates lower on stocks. Now you can see, makes them go up. It's absolutely remarkable that every Fed member is giving speeches about how inflation is out of control and they'll need four rate increases this year. Yet the Fed is still printing 60 billion this month and 30 billion next month. Powell is the Fed's biggest coward in history. Uh, un okay, more draconian stuff coming out of Australia. Savon Henrik says the historical Fed pivot seems to be between 15 and 22% on the S&P 500. In 2018, after a 20% crash, we got that Fed pivot, which again, we were looking at their hiking rates for two years and then went into QT uh, to pull that off. Uh, 2010, uh, they did the uh, Operation Twist. Uh, okay, start playing with 
the yield curve. We had a 15% sell-off to cause that. 2011, 22%, 2012, 15%. So we haven't even started hiking rates yet. So I think it's early to call for a crash right now. Uh, still plenty of time to back talk it. Point is there has not been a single correction of size since 2009 that central banks have not responded to with intervisions, intervention, pivot, flip-flop of some sort. And yes, that included the 2015 when the Fed let the ECP and Bank of Japan carry the water with 5.5 trillion and intervention. That's when China almost crashed. And it's for this reason that nobody takes central banks seriously when they talk hawkish with uh, grandiose drivel about rate hikes and balance sheet reductions. As soon as the market tanks, it's all over. That's why charts such as this are laughable, not only for fantasy reduction outline, but because of the use of the word could and not will, for the next recession will hit before 2025. And so, you know, here's their new chart of where they're gonna let the balance sheet reduce uh, to in the next five years. Jim Bianco, a thread to go over my interpretation of interest rates. First, this is what the market currently has priced in, 36% for the fifth rate hike in February of 2023 is the highest ever. First rate hike in March is now 86% probability. At this point, any talk of no hike in March would have uh, would move the market. Earlier this morning, Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley was on Bloomberg saying he's looking for a 0.6% on the two year at mid year. This, is, this fits our view that the 10 year minus two year curve can invert by mid year. Why are the 10-year yields trending sideways as two-year yields rise relentlessly? And let's just check on that real quick. The 10-year uh, is up 5% today and the two-year 8%. So that uh, it's still uh, flattening of the yield curve, but the 10-year is starting to go up. 10-year yields are a risk-off instrument, not an inflation play. The fact that 10-year yields are not rising in the face of inflation is a market signal that the Fed is going to hike too much and break something. We will know when the Fed has broken something when and if the yield curve inverts. It might not be obvious what broke the day the yield curve inverts, but the market will be signaling that something is indeed broken and it will be apparent in short order. Bonus, why will the Fed hike so much until they break something? Inflation got away from them and is now intensively political. Economists can leave the FOMC boardroom. Hiking to address inflation is now the domain of politics and PR people worried about Fed optics. And we can see the Biden approval rating as the inflation goes up uh, has been highly correlated in a negative manner. Okay, BlackRock just hit $10 trillion in asset management uh, inflation and how central banks see it. Uh, so uh, here's what they were saying as inflation keeps going hotter and hotter. Uh, no risk of inflation in June of 2020. Just the base effect, don't worry, will revert in the second half. Temporary factors, that's transitory, largely transitory, transitory but persistent. And now they've dropped the word transitory. Um, so just as everyone thinks it will never stop and they're gonna have to hike all these rates, I'm actually thinking it will top out uh, and that there's gonna be less rate hikes than are currently being priced. Glenn Greenwald, Biden administration in the last 24 hours, 7% inflation, 33% approval rating. Cinema reaffirmed the filibuster support. Supreme Court struck down the V mandate. Here's comparing the Baltic dry index to case freight from China. Uh, so definitely opposing uh, signals. Uh, one is predicting deflation while the other is still inflationary. Peter Schiff says retail sales unexpectedly tanked by 1.9% December. Excluding autos and gas, the plunge was even deeper, 2.5%. Since these numbers are not inflation adjusted, and since we know prices are way up, the real decline in sales volume is even greater as Americans pay more and get less. Again, this would all 
signal that uh, growth is slowing and that yields should fall right now. Here's the growth to value rotation uh, post dot com bubble. So you can see growth outperforming value. Uh, and then we get from 2010 to current and tech just dominated. Uh, so the big question is, will we get that inflationary uh, growth to value rotation once again, which is what I believe is on the horizon, uh, but needs more stimulus to, to play out. Stephen Van Meter says, I've been saying this is a demand issue with no more stimulus. These numbers are only going to get worse in the months to come. Albert says, oil goes stratospheric and the Fed will have to overhike oil at 90 and the Fed is in serious trouble. Inflation, rate hikes, commodities surging, threat of a S&P meltdown. China PPI indicating easing, easing inflationary pressure. Uh, so the blue line is the Chinese PPI. Stockpiles of copper are almost depleted. Uh, so yeah, these energy prices seem like they are going higher. For those calling peak inflation soon, keep in mind since end of Q1, natural gas and oil are up 85 and 55%. We are yet to see the appreciation in owner's equivalent rent after the largest house increases in 30 years. That doesn't look like peak inflation to me. Uh, again, I'm expecting we do run hot for the next few months and then peak out. That's how we're currently positioned. Uh, tech stocks, boy. Uh, again, we're looking at that trend in yields falling, uh, but only one losing year for tech, 2022, and the year's not over. Okay, we'll leave it here. Jeffrey Gunlack has been very critical of the government lately and typically doesn't say a whole lot about it. Uh, the C word is playing chess and our bureaucrats are playing pin the tail on the donkey. The V have never once been shut down by the V. Um, so, so yeah, we got like half a million, half a billion tests going out. But by then, the, the cases will be essentially done with. Um, so anyways, all right, let's go ahead and switch back to here. All right, guys, so if you're on a free trial or catching this replay, this is where your video ends. If you're not a paid member, you're going to miss out on the trade alert that's critical to protect your wealth. Don't miss the trade alert. Upgrade now. Call Dean at 505-322-7515.